august name that hovers above this lecture series. I wanted to start with an image that I've long thought very affecting. This is Leonardo da Vinci's drawing of what he called a flying machine. The, his proposal is that there will be a person inside this object flapping its wings through the force of their hands, and this thing will then fly. I had the good fortune of traveling in France to Amboise, which is where, as some of you may know, Leonardo died. That's why the Mona Lisa is not in Italy, it's in Paris. He took, it, he took her with him because she wasn't finished. And in uh, Leonardo's museum, there is, in fact, a full-scale model of the flying machine as per Leonardo's sketch. Why am I telling you this? This was the early 16th century. The Wright brothers flew 190. When was the Wright brothers? 1903. So it was 400 years before something actually flew. And it was another 30 or 40 years before commercial aviation became feasible. And that development was completely driven by technology. The internal combustion engine, aluminum, the shape of the wing, and so on and so on and so on. So time passes between an idea which is interesting and useful, such as flight, or genetic engineering of people, and when that idea can actually become reality. So I'm pleased to report that all of you have had the good fortune of living in the decade when human genetic engineering became complete reality. And the most exciting thing for me about it is it's not just about the selfish engineering of you know, the species, seven billion plus members of which live on this planet, but it's a broadly applicable tool. I'm, I'm going to show you a genetically engineered potato, genetically engineered cow, and genetically engineered human. In fact, two. And I'll close with some thoughts on what this important new world of being able to genome edit living things has for all of us as uh, one of the sens sentient creatures on this planet. As Pierre alluded to, I had the good fortune 12 years ago at a biotech company uh, north, here, north of here, north of Berkeley, called Sangual Biosciences, to be the co-inventor of genome editing. We gave it that name by way of an analogy with word processing. Our dream when we put it together was that people would be able to sit in front of a living organism and work with its genetic code the way all of us work with a word processor. But instead of a standard QWERTY keyboard, the only letters would be those of the genetic code. This was an ambitious dream. We did not know it would work as well as it did. It, in fact, has. So I would imagine that by now all of you have heard of CRISPRs. They, uh, to use CRISPRs as a generic for gene editing is like using the iPhone as a generic for all communication devices. Yes, many people have the iPhone, but some of us have an Android. <laughs> and in fact, the iPhone wasn't the first phone or the most widely used one. So in brief, the beautiful thing about gene editing is at its heart lies an engineered nanomachine, tiny molecular scissors made out of a protein that you engineer. And there are at least four flavors, just like there are multiple flavors of smartphones. CRISPRs are on the front page of everything because they are the easiest to use. And they are also the newest. And because they are easy to use and everyone uses them, they have gathered the most public attention. But in fact, as I'm about to tell you, the, the very first ones, the zinc fingers, upper left, are the ones that have been used the most and have been used the, mo on the most people. They have been used on 80 human beings, 8-0. The second oldest, these things called TALs, don't worry about the nomenclature. Gene editing is the one term you need to know. Have been used on two people successfully. They've been used on two children in England who are dying of incurable cancer. They were gene edited with TALs. They are still alive. CRISPRs are the latest and greatest. They're amazing. And 
they will undoubtedly start their clinical trials early next year. So just up front, when I give talks about gene editing, the, the questions I get asked are, what about editing of embryos, germline editing, and editing of human eggs? I'm happy to answer questions about this, but let me give, please take my word for it. It is not an interesting topic. There's, um, the other question I have is, what about this patent fight between UC Berkeley and MIT? Who invented CRISPR? That's an even less interesting topic. <laughs> I can answer the question, but it is not interesting. But so what, what is interesting is this. So you have these beautiful pictures. They're in pseudo-color. The actual machines are completely transparent. They are the color of egg white. Um, Uncolored. Um, so people have worked out ways to engineer these little molecular scissors to cut a gene of interest inside a living cell, a living embryo, a living organism. And what happens when you cut a piece of DNA? Well, Mother Nature wants to repair the break. She wants to put the ends back together again. And when she does that is when gene editing happens. So what gene editing allows you to do is decide what you want to do first, and then do it. So you can get rid of a gene that's called a knockout. You can repair a mutation, such as a mutation that causes sickle cell anemia or cystic fibrosis or thalassemia. Or you can insert a much larger thing, which will be useful, for example, to treat a disease of blood clotting, such as hemophilia. So in putting together this talk, I decided that I would really focus on what is currently happening now. Um, I will admit that 10, 12 years ago, when we called gene editing gene editing, I used to read a lot of popular press about it because all of us were so curious how our baby was covered in the popular media. I've stopped um, because, I mean, I, I don't want to sound condescending. The degree of sensationalism about this is ridiculous. Um, so instead of talking about the things that you can read about in the popular press, I'll talk to you about the things that are actually happening in the real world today. Um, and every time I will, and I sent Pierre with the slides, if any of you want the slides, you're more than welcome to them. I will list the group that is doing the work. So if you want to follow up in terms of what is actually happening in the real world as opposed to the minds of the journalists, you can look that up for yourselves. So story number one comes from Minnesota. It is a healthier potato. It's made by a company called Calixt. Why would you want to make a healthier potato? We thought the potato was already pretty healthy. So um, in brief, if you take the conventional potato, especially one that has been stored for a while, and in many parts of the world, potatoes are harvested only once a year and then are cold stored. When you deep fry it, it makes a carcinogen, so a chemical that causes cancer, called acrylamide. Um, that's because of a peculiar feature of potato biology that is not interesting. What is interesting is the potato's ability to do that, to make the chemical that upon deep frying creates the carcinogen, is due to one gene. So one piece of genetic code in the potato DNA is responsible for this feature of the potato. So this is completely begging for gene editing. Why don't we just take the potato, get rid of the gene, have a nice day. So this worked. I'm going to show you some data. I know it's late. But these are very straightforward data. So this is from the primary scientific paper that describes this work. On the left is how much acrylamide you get when frying a normal potato. And on the right is how much acrylamide you get when you deep fry the gene edited potato, the one that's missing the one gene uh, that is responsible for this chemical being produced. So this is good. And then furthermore, when you deep fry them, it makes for a much prettier potato chip. Ta-da! So, the USDA, which is the branch of the federal government that has control over these that types of things, has examined this gene editing potato and has ruled that because it has no foreign DNA, um, essentially all, it's, all that's been done is one gene has been removed, then it will not be regulated as a transgenic, as a transgenic GMO. Um, so the first reaction, uh, about this potato was typically thoughtful. It came from McDonald's, and McDonald's said that our customers want nothing to do with any of this technology, and we shall not be buying this potato. So whether or not any of McDonald's customers were sat down in front of this and said, Madam, for your evening dinner, 
would you care for the potato with 7,000 units of carcinogen or the gene edited one which has 2,000 units? Which one would you prefer? So, but we live in a climate where the moment, you know, I, I once said to someone in England that I do gene editing of people, this person went, oh, I beg your pardon, is that even legal? <laughs> So the amount of knee jerkiness about this is slightly surreal to me. But the bottom line is, in Minnesota is a company that has successfully gene edited the potato, removed one gene, made it healthier. It tastes exactly the same. It has all of the biology is the same. This is the one difference. The answer I cannot give you is, well, when will you be able to have that healthier French fry? Because that lies outside the realm of science. Um, I will say, though, and again, I sent a pair of slides, by all means, ask him and he will distribute them to you if you want. Many companies, large and small, have provided to the USDA their own crops. There are mushrooms, there are apples, there, there's corn, and there's soybean, there's rice, all made with gene editing. And the central idea is there's no foreign DNA, you just tweak the plant's own genetic material. And in all cases, the USDA has said, well, that, that's not a transgenic GMO, so don't turn to us. So the real battle will now play out in the quote-unquote court of public opinion, and we all know how well that one works. Second, an, a, 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 a more humane cow. Now, I want to emphasize, I was just in um, Petaluma. I took my kids to see the cow farms. I'm not going to stand here and talk about the ethics of eating meat or drinking milk or the ethics of farming in general, but I will say one thing. I was stunned, so by the way, this is work by Recombinetics, a company in the Midwest. They use gene editing to edit a cow. Why would you want to edit a cow? To get rid of its horns. It turns out that commercial cattle grow horns naturally. It's what they do. The horns are removed because if you don't remove the horns, they will attack their handlers and they will attack each other. How are the horns removed? I'm sorry to say, with a blowtorch. So cows, by the time they're old enough to start developing horns, somebody takes a blowtorch to the part of their head where the horns will be and cauterizes that part. So that's one way to do this. The other way is to get rid of the gene that codes for the production of the horns. And that's what Recombinetics did. They used gene editing to take a cow embryo, put this little molecular machine in, snipped out the gene that encodes for horns. There you go. There is a calf which will not need to be blowtorched because it's being gene edited. And again, I don't know that they've submitted this animal, either milk or beef from this animal, for, for any of the, you know, whether you can go to Carl Jr.'s or in and out to buy the ethical, because needless to say, I am sure there's some executive at in and out preparing a statement saying our customers want nothing to do with that technology. Well, whether or not their customers want technology where the animal that produced the meat has been blowtorched is a separate story. So, last few minutes, I have about five, it looks like. Um, gene edited humans, which is what um, I did. So, in brief, we arose, you know, until a week ago, I would have said 150,000 years ago, and these remains were found in North Africa, now it's 300,000. So, this number has changed. Uh, so, that's Homo sapiens sapiens. 50,000 years ago, when we colonized the planet, we started to become genetically modified because our environment selected for the various traits that were adapted to the environment. Just look around the room and you will see examples of that genetic engineering. Starting in 2009, the first gene-edited person uh, appeared, somebody whose DNA was modified in a targeted fashion. So why was this done? So um, this was done by my colleagues at Sango and by yours truly. Um, so uh, this was done to 80 people, including uh, Matt Sharp, the, the guy on the left. The guy on the right is Timothy Brown, the only person of the 39 million people on Earth with HIV who has been cured of his HIV. Uh, he got a bone marrow transplant from a mutant. 1% of humanity are mutant. They lack one gene called CCR5, and they cannot be infected with HIV. That's just their natural feature. So, this man on the left got a bone marrow transplant from somebody, from a mutant like that, natural mutant, and is now cured of his HIV. Well, you can't find enough bone marrow donors like that. They're too rare. So instead, what you can do, and what has been done to 80 people like Matt Sharp, is you bring them to the clinic, you take their blood cells, 
you get rid of the CCR5 gene, so you make them into HIV resistors and you put the white blood cells back in, in the hope that they can go off their meds. Namely, they can stop taking antiretroviral drugs. That's the procedure. That's been done and it's worked. So there are now people who work the earth, walk the earth who have been, in principle, HIV positive for a decade or more, but in practice they're not infectious and they don't have to take drugs anymore and they don't have to take antiretrovirals because their immune system has been gene edited. The second example, this comes from Europe, from a company called Selectus, and they did something called cancer immunotherapy. So this is the Daily Telegraph. There's also a scientific article about this as well. Um, so what you do here is actually really elegant. So this child was dying of an incurable blood cancer. All of the existing drugs failed. Um, the idea, which in fact emerged out of work here in the Bay Area, among other places at UC Berkeley, uh, is to take the immune system and sick it on the cancer. So where does the genome editing come in? What you need to do is you need to tweak the genome of the immune system, tweak the DNA, so that it attacks the cancer with more vigor. That is what was done here. She was basically destined to die. She had less than three months to live. She was treated with immune system cells that were gene edited to attack the cancer. And as best as I know, she's still alive. One other child has been treated with this gene edited approach for her cancer, and she's still alive. I think this is probably the single most promising and significant venue for gene editing in a clinical setting, which is genetically engineer the immune system to attack the cancer. All right, so to wrap up, what's going to happen next? So what's going to happen next is this is going to grow incredibly vigorously in terms of treating disease. What are some of the landmarks to look for? Um, the first set of landmarks is gene editing to treat genetic disease, so thalassemia, sickle cell disease, hemophilia, Gaucher's disease. All of these things are they're cl either clinical trials ongoing or clinical trials about to start, congenital blindness, etc. And the, the logic in all cases is either fix the cells and put them back in, or just put the gene editor into the body and the genome editor does its thing. So this will just proceed unabated and unperturbed. There is a very robust uh, legal, ethical, scientific, commercial, and regulatory framework. All of this is working really well. So will there be gene editing for human enhancement? So we know which gene to get rid of, for example, to have, allow people to sleep less but still feel fine. We know which gene to get rid of or to change to give people better cardiovascular health. Absolutely yes, probably less than 10 but more than five years from now. The only delay is that clinical trials for actual disease need to first play themselves out to be shown to be safe and effective. And then the FDA will start considering proposals for um, gene editing for essentially human enhancement. Um, basic, re basic research is already using gene editing left, right, and center. You can walk, I assure you, you can walk into every lab in this building which does biology research. Every single one of them is using CRISPRs. So it's completely changed the way molecular bi experimental biology is done. Um, Ag, there is a tremendous amount of effort to use gene editing to engineer rice, corn, soybean, um, apple, potato, tomato, uh, pig, sheep, cow. The 64,000 anti-Monsanto demonstrators question, though, is what will the public do? And how will the regulators act with respect to what will the public do? And that is out of my realm. I, 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 have, a, I have a thought, but that thought is not valuable. So nobody knows. Um, and last but not least, other. Um, what else are we to expect from gene editing? So, you know, you may have read this article in the New Yorker about Kevin Esvelt's work, and he wants to rid uh, Nantucket of Lyme's disease by gene editing the mouse, the, the mouse population that lives on Nantucket, uh, to resist the parasite that causes Lyme's disease. Um, you may have read about efforts to engineer the mosquito that carries malaria or that carries uh, yellow fever to no longer be a carrier and thus release these gene edited insects into the wild. I think the science is very strong and undoubtedly proof of concept will be and will be very impressive. But the real question is not what can happen in a test tube in a lab on a campus such as Stanford or Berkeley. The real question is what will happen in the real world. 
And that, as I said a couple of times already, is very much not up to the scientists alone, as it should be. It's up to a much broader regulatory um, and legal framework. But I will say, this is the last thing, I will say this. <clears throat> I was, as you can tell from my name and accent, I was born in the former Soviet Union. I guess Russia, which is in this political climate, a very strange country to be from. Um, and I grew up five minutes away from this monument to Karl Marx, and we were hammered with this quote that you know philosophers have hitherto only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. Um, I can say from my field, which is genetics, that my generation is the first one where this quote has truly come true in the sense that we have been given a tool to rewire the genetic code of the world. And this is happening as we speak. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time.